sustainable, sustainability is a buzzword and has been a buzzword for probably what, five, six years, something like that. And I get just when I think I understand what the definition is, it changes. And so maintenance doesn't to me. Or care. Or care. Yeah, care and maintenance. I mean, I would say these two A and B are really about trying to kind of elevate the goal of a PCL, right? And I and maybe that's where yeah. I was having trouble with because I'm going, what does that have to do with cleaning up our neighborhoods? And yeah. so if I could read this again, just yeah. the very bottom. The reference to sustainable, this is Abel Estrella, sorry. Thank you, Abel. The reference to sustainable preservation, gentrification, and displacement has very little to do with the development of property care ordinance. Um, with the public in their responses to the city's PCO survey, as well as discussion with neighborhood associations and other residents, is primarily one of improving how our various neighborhoods look. I have proposed eliminating the verbiage that does not address that intent and establish ordinance. That's all. Thank you. Stephen has his hand up. And yep, go ahead, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Uh, Stephen Thompson here. Uh, just to address the terminology, and I know that in the ordinance, we will have a list of terms that are clearly defined at the very beginning of the ordinance. So if there are terms or uh, specifics that we need to clearly identify and define, I, I believe all of those will be listed inside the ordinance for people to reference. Just, uh, I, I just quickly Googled the, uh, the term sustainable um, into just a, a search engine. I think oh, it was actually Bing. I, I use Bing. Uh, for this and the definition of sustainable is able to maintain at a certain rate or level. And I think that's a lot of what we're talking about with this property care ordinance is maintaining a base level of care for different for all properties within the city. So I think using the term sustainable is still appropriate. I, I think making sure that we define it in the ordinance in the terminology section is very appropriate and important in this this case and i think keeping the word sustainable is really appropriate for anything that we're doing here because we want to sustain and make sure that these properties and uh properties throughout the city are maintained at a certain level and that's what the basis of a property care ordinance is all about is like making sure things are being maintained in a cell uh, in a safe and healthy way. So that that, that was just a, a comment that I had um, to respond to someone else's comment about removing the term sustainability, even though it is a buzzword, it's still a word that has a definition that is very much appropriate for our discussion and for this ordinance. Um, so th that that was just my comment. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah. And Rick has joined us. Rick uh, Lopez. Uh, Rick Lopez. Um, you know, one of the problems that I have with uh, this property care ordinance and uh, using terms like sustainable is there's an immediate perception. Uh, amongst some people in our community that that automatically leads to uh, the city requiring updating a variety of building codes within a house. It starts to have that connotation that uh, you're gonna have to spend a lot of money to accomplish that objective of sustainability. Uh, the average person doesn't really understand because the definition of sustainability can be this narrow, it can be this wide, okay? And it creates that fear that the minute I have somebody from the city coming to look at my house for sustainability purposes, uh, they're gonna find all kinds of things that they're gonna be requiring me to do. 
And uh, that's that's my primary concern with this is is what it does to I mean, you know, there's already this this fear that people have and why they don't ask for building permits and they do things without building permits. I see it all the time, all the time. And the reason they don't ask for building permits is because they know what that's going to lead to. It's going to lead from point A to point B to point C. And before you know it, you've got all kinds of stuff that the city is requiring you to do. And so there's that fear yeah. that this is going to cause that to happen. It's like dominoes fall. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's the main reason it failed last time is this fear that, yeah, it was going to become a very heavy handed situation. Sarah. Laura has her hand up. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, well, I see both sides of the picture, but we I'm afraid if we start like just um, watering it down, that it's not going to serve a purpose, you know, so I understand that people are fearful because we have many people in the neighborhood who are. Um, I think we just have to make it clear. And if we use uh, clear language in the rest, just saying they have to do um, just clean up their area and make it presentable. Um, you know, if we make it clear, then hopefully there won't be that fear. But I'm worried that if we water down too much, it's not even going to serve a purpose. So it won't even, you know, why even bother? Dan, do we need to look up a purpose again? We, we seem to get stuck on the intent again, but do we need to look at our purpose to make sure we all understand what's the purpose first and then what's the intention. Yeah. I mean, it seems like we've reached consensus. The first sentence of the purpose, I think, is, is pretty standard, right? For the health, safety, and welfare, establish minimum standards. Quality of life is what I would consider. That. Quality of life, Laura, is something you'd like to see in there? Well, I'm just saying that's what I think it's about, because if you come, you drive up to your house and there's a junkyard next to you, you know, it's in your house is all taken care of. It's it's a bummer when you drive up. It's like, ugh, I don't even, you know, like being out here. Thank you. So the reason I added that second sentence was because of the comment last time about trying to understand how this fits in, you know, doing a property care ordinance with kind of overall city goals. And so I really went back to our, right now, what the current council has established as um, priorities and initiatives. And so that's where I took this language about a safe and healthy community. That's a whole category for council. Engage an inclusive community. That's a whole category. And then within that, they have things on social equity and social justice. And it was the comment last time about neighbors helping neighbor, right? This is again where we get down to if we could just put folks in touch, folks who need help with their property, you know, with uh, some resource to help fix it up, even if it's a community cleanup day or something. Um, so again, we're trying to find that balance of where, so then, you know, we can go enforce something, but yet we're going to try to help you <laughs> if you need help. Yeah. Yeah. The part that you added, that last little part. Yeah. Do we want to move that into the intent? Yeah, you, I mean, you know, like, of, yeah. You know, so we have the nice purpose and then do we want to take that and have that be the intent? This is this is Joe Koenig speaking. Yeah, I'm not the senses that you added. Um, I understand why you put those things in there, but it's not clear to me how this accomplishes those goals necessarily. Um, and I like the idea of neighbor helping neighbor, but in theory, that's what's happening right now. And once we have an ordinance, your neighbor's going to call the city and the city's going to come help you. So like, yeah. I mean, here's the reality of code compliance. A lot of the calls Reggie gets, they're not really about the issue, frankly, that he's being called about. It's about two neighbors who aren't getting along. It's, we always find some root issue. There's something else going on. And they get mad at their neighbor, so they call about whatever it is. And yeah, we're in the middle of it. So these are hard things to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, putting it in the purpose and intent isn't going to change people's behavior. It's not 
But I think the idea is to try to give some assurances to our community what we're trying to accomplish, right? That's what we want this to say. Why are we doing it? What, what are we trying to accomplish? So um, these have all been good comments. We can go back and take another look at this. I'm fine getting rid of language and getting back to something just very simple again. I mean, this is the hardest part of these kind of processes is wordsmithing these things, right? Because um, we all would say things in our own voice, right? And we have to try to find some common voice that we can all agree on. Um, David here. I'd like the I'd like the the city staff to reconsider. Um, I, I'm 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 sitting here and I haven't been to the first three meetings, but I've been to many other meetings over the years. Um, I would like that if we need more time, that you take the extra time mm -hmm. and instead of it's good to have a date to go to the city council. But if we're not prepared to do that in September when they come back, then October would be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously we're having some, there's a discussion going on right now about verbiage, mm -hmm. and you want to focus it down um, because I have some questions um, and I, I'm happy to sit down and do what Abel did, write some ideas down. Sure, um, but I don't want to. This is too important to just say we have to do it or we want to do it at the beginning of September with the people going on vacations. And um, so I would encourage the willingness. Yeah, we're not, to, we're not on a, we're not yeah, on a schedule so, where we're absolutely going to have okay, it in front of September. Good. It goes in front of the council when this group feels like it's ready to be presented. Okay. And the staff feels like it's ready. Yeah, you know, we're going to take the time we need. For sure. Any other comments right now on the purpose and intent? I've gotten some more notes and we'll just kind of keep working on it. Maybe pull it back a little bit and maybe just focus on it a little bit again. Um, under C. Can you announce it? Oh, sorry. That's Katie. Thanks, Katie. Under C, um, that first little part that might get to what Abel was talking about the sphere. So if we maybe just looked at that the PCO shall be applied in a force fairly and consistently. Um, if I'm already uh, nervous about my interactions with the city, words like enforced and fairly and consistently could be scary. Um, but maybe thinking about starting with the city because then that shows like the city is willing to work with, you know, whomever. Um, I don't know, but that, yeah. that might, well, we wouldn't enforce it unfairly and inconsistently. <laughs> right. would, so I don't yeah. even know if we need to say that. Um, it's a good language to kind of help. Yeah. It's like recognize. We recognize how people feel about this, right? Well, to pull it away from HOA type talk. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments on this one? We'll keep working at it and we'll bring it back. It's been a good, good discussion. I am sensing we want to really focus on specific things and not this idea of kind of broadening what we're trying to accomplish. I'm hearing is is maybe a is not a good strategy. It's kind of distracting and raising too many questions. I'm seeing a lot of headshakes. Yeah, uh, David here. Um, it, it, you've got some lofty goals when you include um, health and safety. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a if it's a situation where um, uh, a hoarding situation where you've got rats or mice uh, infestation or whatever, that's a health issue. Um, but once again, I, 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 maybe some of those terms need to be taken out um, and put into other codes because I think there are other codes having to deal with health and safety. Um, yeah, our building and codes are. And if we're codes. doing a maintenance or a sustainable right. uh, ordinance for the care and maintaining of property, um, then not that you want to negate those things, yeah. but it's getting too broad. And that's where the, mis, the mistrust and uh, the concern and the lack of support you start losing lack of support in the community yeah. because it's they feel like it's overreach. I have Stephen waiting to with his hand raised. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, Steve Thompson here. Uh, thank you for those comments uh, that just came up. Um, one thing that I was considering going back to the purpose and intent uh, with that second section of the purpose saying thir furthermore implementation of the property care standards reflect so on and so forth. Um, I believe that would probably, uh, as someone else mentioned, I agree that that should probably be moved down to the intent. Like we have our purpose is to protect against hazardous, deteriorating and other dangerous conditions that impact our, our neighborhoods. And then the intent is to implement the, these standards in a way that reflects these priorities. And then uh, listing the priorities under that, I think would be a very good uh, way to balance those two things. And I, I don't know if they're, if the, the recordings of these meetings are available on the website, um, or if, if they're, if they are, then fantastic. Maybe we need to do a little more, uh, outreach as far as like letting people know, like, Hey, listen to these discussions, uh, in advance if you're able so that way you have a, a a clearer understanding of where the discussions have been already um or if it would be possible if at the beginnings uh, of these meetings dan we could go through a brief overview of the previous meetings and what was discussed so that way we can kind of hit those key points of like hey at the previous meeting we discussed these five things or three things or whatever it ends up being and here is kind of the the process that we went through i don't know if there's a way to do that in a summary uh, at the beginning of these meetings or in the email invite or calendar invites that we we send out to folks uh, so just so that way people have a, a better understanding of what discussions have already occurred um, because being a part of this uh, meeting group for for the last four meetings, uh, I'm seeing that we tend to repeat a lot of the conversations um, as we have new folks joining in. And uh, it's always good to have more insight and more perspective. It's also good to have everyone see where the discussions have already been. Um, so those are just a, a couple comments and thoughts as far as like the purpose, uh, transitioning into the intent and then uh, resources for folks to see on the website potentially. So thank you. Yep. All right. Um, so we've been going over the purpose and intent at the beginning because it is kind of a. And we're just going over it every time as a living kind of introduction to it. So. We're ready to move on. I'm sensing. Let me get to my uh, agenda here. All right, so tonight our three topics are discussion on building deterioration, abandoned and vacant buildings, and then vacant and undeveloped property. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. He's got these materials that we're going to go over tonight. The one part of the existing code I want to touch on um, because I'm trying to relate our existing code to these topics as we talk about them. So right now it's this chapter six, which is on nuisances. And you would think nuisances, you probably have an idea what that means. But when you read this, it really is about buildings. It's about a building that's become unsafe. That's a nuisance because yeah, it's either it's unsafe, it's harboring vermin, people are squatting in it, whatever the issue is. Um, and this is a very formal process that's in our code today where Council can give direction either on their own or from a citizen request. Number of city staff go out, do an inspection, give a report. You know, we've not used this process since I've been in town uh, almost nine years, <laughs> short timer. Um, what we really use is our building code. So our building code has a section on unsafe buildings, and we'll have somebody go out from the building department and determine if it's habitable or not, and what those conditions are that need to be taken care of. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. It's the Mark Revis here. Um, 
kind of a regroup of where we've been actually. Um, so when you look at the really big property maintenance ordinances, not property care, which we're trying to keep simple in my mind, that I we pulled out these categories. Those are usually the type of things that are separated out in an ordinance. And they're starting to look similar if we keep looking at how to simplify things. And I still think that's going to be the key to keep things simple. So I listed six of these that we've gone over previously. Debris accumulation, materials, health safety issues, harboring pest fire, deteriorated discarded materials, removal of hazards, those things that could potentially uh, cause harm to people. Then you go with attractive nuisance, which is kind of similar. And I skipped over inoperable equipment vehicles. I have a feeling that that may stay in the world of current code. But if you look at those three of the four at the start, debris accumulation, removal of hazard, attractive nuisance, those tend to kind of be linked in my mind. And you can disagree with me, but I do think we could simplify uh, those categories that we've previously gone over. Then we drop down property perimeter, street frontage. Those tend to kind of be linked. It's always difficult to talk about visual appearance and enforcement of that. So we have to make sure that those descriptions are clear. So any comments, any agreement, disagreement on whether those things could be potentially simplified and linked that would have similar type of statements that we could work toward compliance on? Again, kind of an overview of what we've gone over. So when we start clarifying things, simplifying things, keep them in separate categories or try to unify. Are they yeah. already? They're separate just because that's what I started with. Are they represented in the code elsewhere? Some, yes. Some are. Oh, yes. Virt virtually most things are in the code somewhere, but the ability to notify people and work toward compliance is not simple right now. So there's concepts of program, there's concepts of notification and helping people out and their ability to do that. Um, like Dan just said, he's got something in writing that hasn't been utilized. So how do we how do we work people toward a solution? So Sarah has a person online. Valeria would like to speak. Go ahead. Hi, this is Valeria. I um, have several comments. I'm trying to figure out how to put all my thoughts together on this. Um, it seems I, I I will all start with this. Um, I'd like to hear from like the property owners on how they feel about these um, about these statements. Uh, to me, um, in regards to I'm hearing like almost three different topics here. I'm hearing that this is regarding businesses. I'm hearing that this is regarding notification and um, and and I'll, I'm also kind of hearing like it's blending in with actual properties, uh, like people's homes. Um, and and just like my honest opinion in regards to us talking about businesses, uh, seems like it's a little bit out of re like out of our out of the original conversation. Like it's a little bit too far out from our scope of maybe interest and or maybe opinion. <laughs> you know, I'm sure we have opinions on how like some of the buildings, you know, I know I know we talked about NAU and stuff. Uh, and we talked about like the 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 properties on Milton and Butler and um, Lone Tree, Colorado, all those properties already. 
Um, and there was some comments about that, but it, it still almost, you know, feels like it's a little bit too far away from talking about property care ordinance. Would there be any disagreement with seeing if we could unify some of these to keep the categories simple? Or do you like them separated out? Tough question. This is me trying to figure out how we're going to okay. write this stuff. Um, I think we should um, be very clear on in the intent um, that it would, it's my understanding that you want to discuss residential and the commercial, are you, are you doing a, you want to do this, the, the whole, a blanket approach commercial as well as residential? This is citywide. Citywide. Equal enforcement, equal. those kind of statements. I mean, I was just noticing today and, you know, we keep people participating or talking about their neighborhood. But I was just driving by <laughs> and seeing the level of care on some of the commercial properties. Yeah, because I mean, I, if, if you want to include both, then my personally, I need to, I need to include the commercial because in my mind it was residential. And I'm not sure where we've stated residential with the exception of people that are interested in their neighborhood. So I guess the term guess neighborhood neighborhood has presented a mental okay. image in my head. My neighborhood also is involves commercial. OK. All right. So when I think of my neighborhood, it includes residential homes, historic homes, mm -hmm. and it includes rentals and short term, long term, and it includes um, commercial. Yeah, and no, I'm not but opposed I'll, to that at all. So, but, but I think when I hear the word neighborhood, I think of my neighborhood and I, I've got it all. Okay. So I have to think of it like, right? So I think it's going to, the word neighborhood and the, this is going to be interpreted. We're not going to please everybody. Oh, I know that. And it's going to be interpreted in so many different ways based off of who our reader is. And so our reader is going to have a much different view than mine because of where I live. So I'm just, what I'm saying is I need to expand what my... Um, that's the word I want. That's the word. That if it's to include hey, when that's scope. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but I got an excuse. Um, but anyway, no, I, 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 I am happy to include everything. It's worth knowing what's applicable. Mm -hmm. If that's important, if that's not clear. This, this is able. I just. The answer to your question is, if we can put together as many things that really fit together, we should. Thank you. Okay. I'll, we'll give it a try. <laughs> I'm, uh, David here, I would agree with Abel. Um, I mean, I, I think we need some time. I'm happy to read over this and to, like Abel did, uh, write up a proposal. Yeah, and there's fuller categories that go into the guide, the, statement of the standard and the guidelines. So each one of these, I was just regrouping what we've gone over. No, I understand. So, yeah. so if you want, in my mind, in order to participate in what we're trying to do here, I will spend the energy to read this and sit down and either handwrite or in front of my computer and try to simplify things. Very helpful. Should I just move on to our one of my categories? This, this question about residential and commercial. Um, I mean, we have talked about including all buildings. You know, our current codes apply to all buildings, right? So codes on litter, codes on debris accumulation, deteriorating buildings. I mean, we get a lot of calls on commercial properties on garbage and litter. So I think we do need to I understand um, for this group, a lot of people are thinking about where they live in their residential neighborhood, but I do think it needs to have applicability across all uses. Oh, I, I would agree. Well, you had mentioned, you know, the on uh, Milton, some of the properties that are under process and they've been fenced off for a couple of years now. Yeah, some of those commercial properties. Which none of us probably, well, I didn't think about that. 
Well, we're not talking about my neighborhood. But yeah, you're right. No, that's the topic for today is how long do we let those buildings stay boarded up definitely or should they have some other interim measure? No. Come on up, Mark. I didn't mean well, Sarah, to Sarah get you to sit down. I have Valeria and Laura that both have their hands raised. Valeria, do you want to go? Sure. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm just getting a little frustrated. Um, I I thought that that's what these meetings were for, so that we could uh, discuss um, about these property care standards and ordinance during the meeting, and um, instead of taking them home and looking at them, and you know, I understand that like as far as like the intention and the and the purpose and all of those that. You know that that just seems like an ongoing like work in progress but like we've we've attempted to work on it as a group and um is it possible to attempt um this activity or project right now you know like to to talk about the property care standards right now and, and continue the conversation to see kind of where it leads us to Yes, I mean, that's what we want to do tonight is let's talk about it. So I think Mark's going to get into our specific topics now. I think can I make one comment on that? And, and then I have Laura and Jesse still have their hands up to talk about this before we move on. Sorry, I'm trying to represent everybody now. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think it would be really important if, you know, if you would like to provide something in writing for a process like this, recognizing it's hybrid, um, to we could have a way for folks to provide comments between meetings that can then be sent out to everyone. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're writing portions of it outside of this collective group because that leaves out the people who are joining online. So just for fairness for folks who can be here in person and not be here in person, I think we need to um, We'll, maybe Dan and, and Mark will need to decide how that can work so that we're not, um, so it's a good intent to come and pass papers around. I had to take a picture and load it up, and that doesn't give the folks who are participating online equal opportunity to reflect on what's being shared in the room. So just a process point there. And then Laura, you wanted to go, and then Jesse. Um, I'm good. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Jesse? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe just maybe refocus is that we we have a lot of these standards already in ordinances all over the place of the city of Flagstaff. And to me, it was just to keep it simple. Uh, you know, we don't want to go into details. I think what we wanted to do is make sure that. I mean, if there's somebody that is just and doesn't really care about how their property looks or their absentee landlords, that the code compliance officers have something to go to uh, instead of, well, let's see, that belongs to police. No, that's belongs to this. This belongs to that. This belongs to whatever department. And I think we just got to keep it simple. Um, and I think what's uh, what uh, is being pr proposed is is just uh, simple standards. I mean, uh, if there's debris accumulation, I mean, if you can't see the house, at least the code enforcement officers have a have something to go to. And I don't think we need to. You know, get into the into the nitty gritty is, is what I'm saying. Let's just keep it simple. Thank you. Um, Rick uh, Lopez here, you know, one thing I'm hoping that the city will do, and I, I think I brought this point up to the fourth, is if we're going to be talking about commercial properties and having some guidelines as to how long they can have their uh, commercial frontage uh, looking boarded up and with chain link fence around it and stuff, is that we will have some dialogue with NAU uh, who doesn't seem to want to do anything with their boarded up buildings anytime soon. Uh, and it's going to be hard for us to have any kind of a heavy hand with other commercial properties uh, when their next door neighbor being possibly NAU or someone across the street who's saying, well, if they don't have to comply, why do I have to comply? Uh, you know, I, I, I hope that we can get NAU 
to be a good community neighbor as well. But I think part of this goal of trying to bring commercial properties uh, along, uh, we need to have those conversations very frankly with NAU and, uh, and hopefully they'll they'll agree and, and be persuaded to uh, to work with us on that. Today, we'll just say uh, a Sunnyside resident said, hey, we're starting in the flood period and we're going to hit some floods and we're going to have some stuff in our yards and in the streets. Make sure that people understand that this does not apply to those situations that are absolutely temporary and temporary might be longer than a month, two months. I have just no definition for it, but they said, hey, we'll remember this when you go over there, because if we start getting fined, because, you know, two months later, the debris is still there from the sheetrock and everything that's sitting right there on the curb. So I'm doing that, I'm reminding. Yeah, that, <laughs> that could easily be a statement in there that's, you know, construction situation, while well, we're talking, you know, construction time periods, that type of stuff. So, but again, you know, Putting a penalty, which is not the intent, because we don't, you know, even though it's in some of ordinance, you know, that's not the intent. It's to help people through it. So I keep saying we're hearing effective tool availability of resources for people that can't, um, reasonable, you know, implementation of it. So, Sarah, have you got something well, like your comments? Well, Lydia? Hi, this is Valeria Chase. Um, I'll start off by saying that I'll go uh, to bat for NAU when I have to, and I'll go to bat for the city when I have to, but um, I think the city's kind of covered today. <laughs> um, but I'll say that um, I th that NAU would be, like if the city has standards um, in regards to like the properties and how, you know, like the property standards for like commercial businesses and and um, for yeah for commercial properties, um, that NAU will be a good neighbor and comply as well. Um, yes, you know it's been mentioned and everyone knows that it's a state um, institution property, but as neighbors of, and of, as part of the community, we would um, comply with whatever standards do exist. Jesse, okay. do you also have a comment or is your hand up from last time? Actually, I forgot to put my hand down, but now I do have a comment. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think Valeria's right. I think that uh, NAU uh, has to be made aware, but I mean, why is NAU being an exempt? Uh, you know, they should be good neighbors. And I think they have been trying to do that. Uh, but again, it's one of those things and I know uh, Rick, I understand where you're coming from because I see Granny's closet every day and I see the cables every day. And it's it's a shame that those buildings are just deteriorating with historical value too. Uh, what is what is NAU's plans? I mean, there it's a top secret somewhere. Uh, so maybe there needs to be more communication from whatever the planners are over at NAU with uh, the city of Flagstaff and, and, and with the citizens of Flagstaff. Thank you. I could, I could do that. <laughs> Kate. Actually, that was, um, thanks, Jesse. This is Katie. Valeria, I guess that was a question I was going to ask for you as the NAU representative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, does NAU have, um, what is the strategic plan, their roadmap for mm -hmm. those, some of those properties? And maybe we could help foster the conversation between NAU and, and the city. And then based off of what NAU says, we could use that to then decide what would be appropriate for other commercials, right? So if any use like we have a five a five year plan, right? Then we think, okay, maybe we allow commercials five years of boarded up. And then at that time, I don't know. I'm just throwing out numbers. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, so I don't know, Valeria, if you have any insight into any of that. Um I heard several questions. Um the, yeah. <laughs> I'll try to address them as I can remember. Uh, but NAU is coming up with a with a a ten year master plan, and um, I also know that they're hiring for the like the 
the person who you know is is um, the capital the vice president for capital assets. Um, so um, that process is going to start soon, and they will be um, also including d different uh, community partners into that conversation. I know that um, Friends of Flagstaff Future is going to be consulted. Um, I know that um, the neighborhood associations are going to be consulted. I know there's like two, um, I, I, I remember that they had mentioned two others, but I can't remember their names right now. Um, and, and, and can you repeat the other questions that you asked? Yeah, I don't know if they, I don't even know, Valeria, if there are even questions that you can answer. I think it's just more so, you know, if we know what the strategic roadmap is for NAU with those buildings and what the plan is and the timeline, then how can we help, we as the, you know, the property care ordinance team help foster that conversation between NAU and the city? And then can we then use what NAU's plan is to think about how other commercials might be using their properties and because I don't know what the I don't know what a good timeline is for how long we want places for I I'm no I think that I no, think I, I'm sorry excuse me no no I'm I'm done I think that um we're kind of looking like you know taking the lead from the city so like if the city says you know this is it then um you know we're we're we'll be good neighbors and 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 comply with the with the requirements you know with yeah. the fact that you know there might be some cushion there because we are a state so um but it'll get done eventually you know so like it, it would be hard like i think we're we'd we'd be taking the lead from the city rather than us giving like a timeline um on how much time would be enough or too much to uh, or enough time to like you know like to bring it down or to deep or you know take the boards down things like that so i think we'd take the lead from the city in that in that direction um okay so i'll share that this isn't public knowledge but like the three houses behind uh, uh granny's closet um there's been and then you all know that um there's been a lot of squatting there there's been some uh this you know just like trash and things like that so i know those are mid like sometime in july they're gonna come down those three homes as far as granny's closet i don't know much elizabeth thank you hand up and so does steven elizabeth elizabeth hi, hi elizabeth richardson um so First of all, thank you for the conversation. I think it's really incredibly interesting and I can see how much work that this group has done so far. And I appreciate everyone who's worked on this um, because it's it's really impressive. Um, I, I did wanna bring up something. I work with the health department. I've also uh, was the for former compliance manager for Coconino County. I've worked with Reggie. I know that he's one of the best that I've ever seen. He really works very hard to be incredibly fair and resolve situations and works to find resources. I think if anything, his hands are often tied um, by just really lack of, of regulations that can help him resolve situations. Uh, he and I worked on something recently and what we found is that uh, there's a lot more problems happening right now with the elderly and people with mental health issues. Um, we had a case that went on for a few months with an elderly woman here in Flagstaff whose plumbing had stopped working for some reason. She ha was struggling with Alzheimer's and um, she, we could not locate family. Her toilet was not working and she was dumping her sewage in the driveway and not really aware of what she was doing. I felt terrible for her. I also felt terrible for her neighbors. Uh, this created a very intense situation and where there was a, a certainly a health and safety hazard. And so I think that, you know, we wound up, and it wouldn't have helped us to do enforcement with this person. And I think that we're gonna see more situations like this. We wound up calling adult protective services 
to try and get some help in that way. But I was, I just wanted to talk about this case and, and see how we as a community may deal with the increase in cases like this. And if we need maybe a volunteer group, kind of like Habitat for Humanity or something like that, um, that will assist with repairs because we couldn't find any funding to help her and she was impoverished. So that's what I have. And again, thank you very much to the group. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth, for the kind words. I agree with what you said about Reggie. Um, I think he takes the right approach. And it's, I think we've talked about the results of writing tickets and finding people and taking them to court versus the approach we take now. And I think we find our approach, frankly, is more effective because the history of taking these kind of things to a judge is not good. It's not successful a lot of time and energy and money on any of everyone's part and i know there's a disagreement about that a lot of people want us to start writing tickets and that's just not our culture right now and I'm, i support that we do have a lot of mental health issues reggie deals with a lot of really difficult issues just uh, i know we've got other comments Valeria, thank you for your comment i'll just say nau is very responsive whenever we contact nau about any of your properties you know, Granny's Closet is in compliance with what the code requires. So this is a good launching point. Is that good? Should we just allow people to? Right now, the code basically says you secure the building, you can board it up, um, you secure it, right? You don't let people trespass, all these kind of things. Um, doesn't become an attractive nuisance. You know, is that good enough? Uh, some property property maintenance ordinances or our PCO it actually says like within six months, you have to put a window in, you have to put a door in. So even if it's not occupied, some of these things require you not, they just don't allow you to board it up, right? And so there's pros and cons of that, I think. The good, the pro is it looks better, right? I think if it has doors and windows, even if it's vacant. The owner certainly doesn't like it because it's gonna be repeated break-ins and they're gonna have to keep coming back and probably replacing doors and windows. Um, does that make it more attractive? Does it really lend itself to getting somebody in the building? Um, but let's let's try to launch into this discussion about abandoned buildings and boarded up buildings. So should we stick with our current standard, which is you secure it, um, or should at some point have to be brought back to life? I'll just say. Um, the other thing I want to say about Granny's Closet, I'm not trying to go down this rabbit hole. I'm going to do it. Is there was a joint grant between NAU and Mountain Line? Just so you know. So NAU has a, they have a plan to create a new entrance there, a fourth leg at that intersection. And so it's a real challenge, the engineering challenge, because it's all, it's not square, right? And so long term, they said they bought Granny's Closet potentially to create a new entrance. Um, there is a plan. I don't think it's going to be, be implemented anytime soon because of different issues, but uh, that's what I've been told. I think all you're right. getting Granny's Closet and the old Mandarin buffet mixed up. Mandarin buffet, oh, buffet. is the one Thank that they're, they want to put a fourth leg at, at that end. It's Mandarin buffet, the one, not Granny's. The old Gables. The Gables. The Gables. Thank you. The Gables. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. There are, it's things blend together. Yeah. But they own both of those properties. So. Yeah, you know, you know, I, I think my biggest problem with, uh, it's not a general problem with any use, it's just a, a specific Thing. And, and again, I, I don't know the, the what's real. I've just heard from uh, someone who who works for NAU, and one or both of those buildings have been determined to be absolutely unusable. They just can't be used for anything. So my question is, if they're unusable, <clears throat> they're probably going to tear it down. At some point, well, why not tear it down now? A vacant lot would be better looking than a boarded up building. Uh, well, money's going to be spent anyway, whether it's today or six months from now or six years from now. They're going to spend the money to tear it down because the building is unusable. So tear it down now. Um, and you know, as far as some of these other commercial properties where they're waiting for somebody to buy it, they're waiting for other kinds of use. I do think we need to put some kind of timeline on there because I think uh, there's a certain amount of foot dragging that just goes on year after year after year after year. I mean, I've seen some of those buildings on South Mill Road have chain link fences around for the last three, four, five years. I mean, they've been that way for years. 
or like the Pueblo Motel. Like the Pueblo Motel, just, well, yeah, like that. And, you know, and so they remain to be eyesores for, for years and years and years. Um, and if there's no motivation, no time frame, then there's no motivation for them to do anything with it. And they can just hang on to it forever. Uh, so I, I do think we need to have something in our property care ordinance that addresses that issue. Um, that if they abandon a building, they close it down, they put a chain link fence around it, board it up, that there has to be some kind of time frame that that's acceptable. But beyond that time frame, they need to get with it and do something with it. You know, sell a property, tear it down, whatever they're going to do. But I do think that we need to have something because these these entryways into our community uh, coming up South Mill Road, that's that's our main entrance into our city. So it it tells people something about our city as they're driving into it. And when they see one chain in, uh, chain link fence after another boarded up building after another, it, it sends a message. It says, "Boy, you know, things are things are not look, looking too good in Black Uh So I think we need to have something in our ordinance that does that. Um, so I, and I don't know what that is, what the right time frame is, but I think we do need to have something that that speaks to that. This is a light. What you clarified for me just now is is that discussion we had a little while ago. We need different rules, guidelines for private versus commercial. Because what if the same thing happens to a house, Mark, that you own that right now you can't do anything with? You bought it in Sunnyside and you're going to fix it up and board it up and it stays that way. To me, that's a little bit different than the commercial stuff that's going on on Milton and Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it clarifies that it's, we, we've got to probably address those different. We'll see where that lands. We'll give it a, we'll give it a good thought. So, but just, you'll see my <laughs> heritage preservation officer, you'll see me make statements like El Pueblo has a plan set for total restoration of historic buildings, uh, compliance with preservation and a new motel behind it. Again, that's kind of informing people what's going on. You know, where's NAU? Where's this project? And it's, you know, in progress. So, yeah. So, Abel, just quick follow up. Sorry, Abel, how, do you, how do you think this should be looked at differently? Just to dial down a little more between like- Well, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm talking about a commercial building and I'm looking at my neighborhood, Sunnyside, and I know that there's a lot of, old garages, carriage houses and stuff that are just sitting there and they're sagging. You know, they're sad. They store stuff in them, but they're sagging. I don't know if I would treat it the same as NAU because those people in Sunnyside don't have the same kind of money that NAU has. So I don't know if I have the answer to the question other than they need to be treated differently because one is big pockets, the other one is little pockets, and so those to me big are treated <laughs> big pockets and also a bureaucracy that has to go through and take a lot of time. But it's really tough to try to <laughs> walk our way through this. I think Sarah, you have somebody online. Yeah, another thing to think about with vacant buildings and abandoned properties is that. Sometimes they are that way because they are tied up in legal proceedings like probate, which happens to many families when someone passes away without a will, and or they have title issues, the kinds of things that courts um, have trouble resolving. If you have a city ordinance, usually, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding, and Dan will chime in here, if you have a city ordinance that says something has to be remediated in six months, and there's a property in that condition, the city can petition the court and say, we have some assets from this probate, please, to address and bring your building up to code because it's not complying and that takes time. But when we have no rules with timelines like that, that's one of those things that's maybe missing from Reggie's toolbox is that he can't have an attorney go to court and tell a probate judge, 
we found this building's out of compliance in our city. We need you to free up some assets from this estate to help address what's going on on the property. Um, because if there's no timeline, it can just be that way forever and ever, right? There's, I think that's what Rick's saying too. So thinking of that as well, that there's lots of people's scenarios, um, the compassion and the purpose and intent hopefully keeps the city from acting in a way that is outside the bounds of what's what would be reasonable, but also think that there are sometimes more than just, you know, a homeowner involved. It can be fairly complicated. So we've got to have something that works in all of those situations, but as Dan said, isn't weaponized against neighbors who really need community care and support. Um, and so that's, that is the balance that is planners sit down at the table and have these discussions with you that we're always kind of bearing in mind. I'm going to jump into our three categories <laughs> and I will do them fairly quickly. They do have similarities to what we've done. So deterioration, you can, you will obviously see um, a concern on my end as heritage preservation officer or most people, you know, in the world are historic preservation officers that hug buildings. So this is my big hang up and I will read the standard. Property care standard for building deterioration. Provide remedies to the deterioration of a building that threatens its longevity and allows for continued safe and healthy habitation. That's me preserving buildings. Can't help it. Uh, guidelines. Prepare, secure, replace, and properly dispose of deteriorated materials. I won't read every guideline, but roofs, exterior walls, Features such as trim soffits, uh, chimneys, those type of thing. Exterior windows allows for penetration and moisture. Uh, exterior, oh boy, this is a tough one. Exterior finishes of paint stain waterproofing. These are things that lead to the loss of a building and a loss of an available property to assist in uh, saving energy. I'll use the word sustainability and also historic preservation and providing housing. So those are some of those things. So I am definitely, this is something, I don't know if we wanna reach that far, but I do think it's an issue. Is it covered enough in our building code? Do we put it into property care? Is it just the fact that it relates to one of these other areas? This is a really tough one. I want it to happen, but it doesn't happen via this vehicle of property care or in current building code. And I can see everybody's thinking really hard because it's a really tough question. This is a like, as you know, I sent something out. And I said, don't you worry about the paint. Just, to, just don't you worry, the house is in fine shape. You know, I, and from the outside, it looks just fine. Don't you worry about the paint. And I heard that time and time again. And I, and I say, when you don't worry about the paint, you're going to lose the building. No, I, well, yeah. I, I, I understand. Yeah. It's just, and whether it's just that I heard it so much. Oh, and I agree. It's that we don't want a homeowners association telling you. Yeah. So where we stop on that list of yeah. things, or whether it's one paragraph about that allowing moisture and making your building not inhabitable is an issue. Right. So maybe it's a, a more compressed that gives uh, code compliance a little bit of a, I'm notifying you that there's a situation here. So let's say there's a renter and they're starting to get mold on the walls and things along that line because they have a missing window, they have penetration through the roof, that type of stuff. I think that is a situation of health and safety that may be able to be simplified from what I just did. So I'll jump into the next one so we have time. Vacant buildings is um, pretty much similar to what I did on, on property. So we're pretty much just going over that same uh, list again of it would be applied, you know, when we talked about frontage, when we talked about the look of things, it's pretty much 
applied to the whole building. So I'm using the same language. So this is me just kind of reacting to things and what is potentially you know, possible here. So we have street frontage, we have vacant buildings, we have attractive nuisance. You know, again, where do we unify? Where do we simplify? Standard that I wrote, uh, property care standard for vacant buildings, resolve both visual and physical issues with vacant buildings that negatively impact property values. That's a tough one. And the desirability of adjacent properties in the neighborhood. Being a little arbitrary, but people keep talking about impacting their neighborhoods, people not caring. Guideline repair, secure, remove, and properly dispose of deteriorated materials, which indicate an appearance of abandonment visible from the street frontage or you know the entire property. So those signals that a lot of police have noticed that cause buildings to be attractive nuisances to be immediately accessed, litter, door hangers, mail, broken, loose, damaged components, graffiti, um, vacant uh, buildings uh, that aren't secured, you know, have proper uh, secured locks. Here's where we have a potential to um, rectify some of those problems. Site shall be properly posted, no trespassing, and include contact information of management or owner. It's they may call the city, but they're also there has to be some responsibility of the actual owner, and that we're not the one just holding it. I found that effective in Butte, Montana. Doors secured with locks, screws, wood blocking on doors to prevent access. Windows secured with screws, wood blocking, run access. Board up. This is kind of a concern about appearance, but this has also been effective in my mind. Panels shall be cut to fit windows and door openings. Panels are to be painted or stained to improve appearance. Panels shall be secured with adequate screws and or tamper resistant uh, options. Problem areas of entry provide additional means such as interior blocking with through bolts. So we had a lot of, of abandoned buildings, vacant buildings in Butte, Montana. Those were some of the things that we ended up doing. That worked. Uh, Rick Lopez again. You know, uh, I think we have to be a little bit careful when we start getting into uh, the term negatively impacting property values uh, because who determines what that is? And I think one of the concerns is that, and it, it's although it's not related, it's you hear it all the time when we try to do a higher density building for affordable housing, people will automatically raise the point that we don't want it here because it's going to negatively impact our property values. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful when we use that term. Uh, to create any kind of an ordinance because um, it it can be used over here where it just doesn't make any sense and probably shouldn't be used used and there's no uh, there isn't any uh, evidence that that happens at all so we just have I think we just have to be careful when we're using that term because nobody really knows what that means and there's no evidence to indicate that it happens. It's mentioned so often in all the examples. Yeah. So if removal of that may be a good thing. Yeah. Right. So I think I think we should. Yeah. I agree. I think it, that language everyone uses that as a reason. Right. So yeah. It's devaluing for or against something. Right. <laughs> you know, but you know somebody I, mentioned quality of life. Yeah. It bothers you. <laughs> if I was in Continental, they it, it definitely is an issue, but I'm in Sunnyside and I have not heard it once. Not once that it's going to devalue my job. Mostly because the house is over there and the yards are not Continental. Well, I'll give you an example. In, in the Ponderosa Trails, it was used uh, constantly over that new proposed development there on the corner. 
Uh, and, you know, there's tax credit developments all along Highland High Country uh, Trail. Uh, and as far as I know, the, the property values of the Ponderosa Trails have not been diminished one bit from those uh, affordable housing developments that are, are all along High Country Trail. But yet that argument is still used to say, no, we don't want that here. Uh, you hear it all the time, you know, and, and there's just no evidence that it, that it does that. And it just isn't. I, I guess I would suggest not using that as part yeah. of the, you know, the property that's going to this, affect property value. This is but great. Not use that. Yes. It's uh, great to clear things out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will do the last one. Um, probably good to put an example on this. Not vacant buildings, vacant property. Lots. Let's pick one out like the Plaza Vieja and the former trailer park. Mm -hmm. Yep. Weeds, materials, things sticking up. Hopefully not electrified or anything else. But just put that in your mind on this has no building on it. So it's maybe, you know, it's going to be developed in the future. It's just sitting there. Who knows? So this one is um, property care standard for vacant un developed property, maybe that's the wrong word. Vacant properties shall be kept free of hazard and conditions that impact adjacent properties. I don't know, it's the best I could do. <laughs> Remove and properly dispose of litter accumulated on the property. That's basically, again, paper, plastic, metal, debris, health and safety issue. Uh, piles of solid materials that are harboring insects, rodents, pests, again, similar. Dry materials, grasses, branches, combustible, fire danger. Hazardous and dangerous conditions that may case, cause harm or provide for an attractive nuisance that supports criminal activity. These are kind of similar. Encroachments into neighboring properties and public right-of-ways. Um, some level of additional potential. Posting and security. Vacant sites and lots shall provide identifiable and maintain boundaries. Sites should be properly posted for no trespass and include contact information of the management or the owner to report problems and talking about neighborhood desirability. Vacant property owners are responsible for security of and addressing problems associated with the property. Is this the same as having a building on it? Or is this different? Um, <clears throat> David speaking. Plaza Vieja, is that the piece of property that is right below natural uh, natural grocers? I'm saying I'm trying to get the street. Yeah, that's it. Yes, that's the neighbor. It's, it's the property that is behind O'Reilly's. There you parts. go. Oh. Village. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're the mobile home park. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm, speak I'm speaking of. Okay, so let me speak about the property that is at the corner of Butler and Milton. Mm -hmm. When I was back in the 80s and 90s, I was at a, a part of a beautification group in town, Citizens for a Beautiful Flagstaff. And we went to the city multiple times to, we had people who were willing to donate money to landscape that corner. We were constantly told, we don't want you to do anything until we put in the proper drainage. So I don't remember now, 15 years ago or something, they came in approximately, they came in and addressed the drainage issue. Um, and at that point, our the the beautification group was no longer in existence. It and so that remains in my my thought an eyesore. That okay, we waited, and we had the money to to come in and landscape and and I you know an easy landscape, I, I, easy to care for, nothing fancy just to put in some trees and so on. And You're saying the south. Southwest west corner. Corner where the drainage, where, right. where we're talking right about. Natural, right in front of natural, yes. Big channel, right. 
and yeah. and so we waited and waited and waited and then so it the, the flooding situation was addressed but that still remains an eyesore yeah no one cuts down the weeds no one does anything uh, when you said that your beautification organization doesn't exist a uh, city does have beautification do. and money yes. so that's that's a, a distinction i just wanted to state uh, beautification did do the divider down uh, Butler. That was a beautification funded project. You mean it separated an AU from everything else? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and I've the, heard that one too. Okay, so because our group wasn't able to do, I mean, that small, that was a small project. What we took on, and I don't know anybody, whether anybody remembers Project Evergreen. And starting at Fanning, and that was an, an eight year project during the 80s, dealing with the 3N Corporation in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to remove all of all the billboards from Fanning to the railroad depot, the freight depot, which is now BNSF offices. Um, there was a wall of, you remember that, a wall of billboards and they were butted up against each other all the way along. It took us seven years, eight years to get rid of those and start landscaping that property, that strip. It was a three mile strip. I watched all the movie and they were still there. I recall that. And <laughs> so the easy rider, huh? I um, probably was another one too. Yeah. So and and I mean the city, the city was embroiled in uh with 3M. They threatened to over and over again, threatened to uh, emptied the coffers of the city and shut this the city down and that didn't happen and they finally um, realized that it was a losing battle so we started they started allowing us to take down so many a year for eight years and i can believe that area is associated with uh, drainage and the realignment with the rio i'm not sure sarah or uh not in that area no that's not the there. other side of no, town not towards the ball side of the tracks Sarah, has somebody online? Yeah, Laura would like to jump in. Um, I yes, this is Laura. I just wanted to let you know that Natural Grocers owns that property. We did do a beautification there uh, quite a few years ago, and then they came in, you know, and did the drainage. But that's Natural Grocers' property, and they should be maintaining it, and they're not. So I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. I shop there. I will be talking to the appropriate people. Thank you very much. Do you have um, to answer that so, question again, just to keep it alive? Um, are vacant lots different? Or are some of our provisions applicable to property in front of a house? Are they one and the same? If or property in front has issues or is it worth doing something different like you're saying making commercial distinct making vacant property distinct I don't have the answer but well let David again let me throw an idea a thought out you have a, a, a vacant piece of commercial property and you go to the owner and say, we need you to do something to it because it's an eyesore. So more than likely, they're going to bring in, they're going to hire someone with a backhoe and they will go ahead and just strip it, put it in a dumpster and you're done. And now you've got wind erosion, um, dust blowing out into the streets. Um, so there needs, you know, I, I see that they're two different things. I think you, there's residential, commercial, um, and I don't see if you go to someone who owns a home or a homeowner, whether it's rental or whatever, and you say you need it cleaned up, I doubt that they're going to just strip it. Right. And so we talk visual. I'm always very cautious about visual and eyesore and those type of things. But the way that was left a condition that still has in my mind walking through here as the fence has fallen down and you can easily walk through, um, there's dangerous conditions in there. So is it how you leave the property? Is it safe? 
Does it have issues that will cause problems to neighboring properties? So I, I just want to make sure we're clear on visual versus health and safety. We can enforce health and health and safety is what I keep hearing. Yeah, we can talk about improving visual aspects. Well, I think that if you Steve and Laura oh, have yeah, their hands up. Yeah. Sorry, Steve and then Laura and then Rick. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, Steve Thompson here. Um, based on the conversation that I've been hearing and listening to for quite some time, um, the distinction between different types of property, whether it's private, residential, commercial, uh, educational, state, uh, all, there's a lot of different types of property that are within the city of Flagstaff. And I think we are really getting tied up into the weeds here on like the very specifics and trying to make a a fit all sort of ordinance, which may not be the most appropriate. Would it be appropriate at some point in in the our ordinance that we're working on is having a, a tagline or a line in there that states specifically that, hey, this will change uh specifics based on the type of zoning that this property is in or the, the the specific type of property that it is because there is a significant difference between what i as a renter uh in in a in a town uh, townhome uh can and is financially able to do to maintain the property that i am responsible for under my lease agreement versus a commercial property like starbucks or uh, a property management company and so i i think in our property care ordinance in order to try and fit all of these different needs and perspectives we may need to say specifically like in our ordinance that hey all of these different ordinances that we have will have a specification for these different types of zonings um and i'm not sure like as far as like what the state has in place as far as like property care or uh, legis like specific rules and regulations based on the type of property. So if there's any way that we can reflect what is already there without recreating the wheel, um, I think would be the most beneficial. But from the, the, the last like 20 minutes of conversation, I think there needs to be a distinction that there are different types of property and different types of property based on their ownership and zoning will require a different level of care, whether it's an active business, a private residence, a vacant lot. And we may be able to just say in this initial draft that specifications will be detailed later. Um, and as much as I, 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 I'm always a big fan of trying to get as much information and detail into regulation or guidelines as possible in advance. I, I don't want to get, get bogged down to the point where we don't accomplish anything. And I, don't let perfection get in the way of getting something accomplished uh, because there's always an opportunity to come back and amend and adjust and add to. And in our time here, we'll be able to set a great foundation for what property care ordinances look like in the city. Um, I, I just don't want, uh, in our working group, we're not gonna be able to solve every single solution or every single problem and come up with solutions for all of that. So that's just something that I wanna uh, make a mention of that we can do a lot with our working group and accomplish so much we just won't be able to solve every single thing that's going to come up. And with uh, keeping our language in the ordinance itself a little more broad, 
it allows us to interpret it in a broader sco scope a little bit later. And one other thing that I would like to mention, and this might be something um, I'll bring up at the next meeting as far as ground rules, like um, focusing more on an issue and leaving out the blame. I've heard quite a bit of blaming going on, whether it's directed at NAU or absentee landlords or businesses or uh, other folks that may or may not be around. I think when we are discussing issues at hand, we should focus more on the actual issue and how we can resolve that with this ordinance versus simply saying, it's so-and-so's fault, and I don't understand why they're not behaving in a certain way. Um, so that's just something that maybe we should add to our ground rules is not uh, assigning blame to any group or individual and just focus more on like, hey, this is the issue that I'm seeing, and this is what we can do to resolve that issue or problem. Uh, so those are just some comments that I have as we've been discussing for for quite some time on the differences between types of property. So thank you. Who else did you have? Laura is next. Laura. Hi, this is Laura. Um, I, uh, Mark, I think that vacant properties is very important because we've been um, working with trying to work with the area Arrowhead property problems for some time and I think um, Steve I respect your um, your take on everything but the thing that I worry about is if we make it too broad then it's not going to do anything so I think we do need to be kind of specific on on many things so that it actually works thank you Dan do you want to I think, wrap it up I think for, Rick has oh, comment Rick, first. Sorry. Yeah, I, have last I, I, I was just going to make a comment regarding um, the, the vacant land. Uh, I think if we focus on health and safety, the visual will more than likely take care of itself. Because again, I don't know how we uh, address visual uh, with vacant with a vacant property. I mean, the weeds are going to grow. And, uh, you know, litter is going to accumulate and all that kind of stuff, you know, when wind blows, which it does all every spring. But I think health and safety are things that we do have a responsibility to make sure that a, a vacant piece of property doesn't become uh, an unhealthy and unsafe place uh, within any neighborhood. So I, I think we just focus on those two things and the visual will more likely take care of itself. So the wording can be very similar to some of the stuff we've done, but I'm hearing that it needs to be a category. Yeah, and I, as a separate standard for vacant. Yeah, vacant. I could be right, I could be wrong. This is Joe Koenig here. Um, yeah, so I support this idea of keeping things simple, and I think if you keep them simple and focus on the issues, you don't have to have a breakout for different types of properties. I think that's going to get really complicated and it doesn't make a lot of logical sense either, right? I mean, like if we're concerned about health and safety, it should apply the same to a residential property or a commercial property as well. Um, I think with all this overlap here, you know, I think you have like the same exact sentences and multiple ordinances. I do. <laughs> um, and so I don't see a need for that because every ordinance applies, right? And so like you don't have to repeat things. And so I think if you eliminate all those repeat things, it would, take care of itself and break down to be pretty simple. Um, for instance, the vacant property seems like it'd be covered totally by debris accumulation, removal of hazard, detracting, you know, and so um, I support collapsing these things down as much as possible. Um, and I, I don't understand why a, a vacant building would be different than a vacant property. Yeah. It, would, it I, would be different from frontage of an occupied property that right. is just not cared for. I've had that debate in my mind. I yeah. appreciate any input. And uh, again, it's just that's what's so clear about when you look at any of the examples. They repeat themselves again and again and again and again, and they get super specific and they don't get to the point. So. I we will keep looking at that. 
Yeah, and I think and I think we can add some specific language too for some of these things. I was thinking about the Arrowhead Village example. Um, I know one of the concerns is kind of abandoned utilities, right? So you've got pipes coming up out of the ground, and you know there's a fear: is it active? Is it it's abandoned? But even that that pipe is a hazard, right? And um, so maybe we can look at some of those things um, that could be strengthened on some of these abandoned properties, vacant properties. If, if uh, David here, yeah, I'd, I'd like to leave on a positive note. Okay. I I have over the years in my 40, almost 44 years of living in Flagstaff, I have been very proud and pleased over and over again with commercial as well as residential properties where people have had pride of, of ownership. And you know, different different businesses have come in. They've been willing to um, come in with some beautiful architecture and some gorgeous landscaping, and they maintain it. And that's the important thing. Uh, we can we can speak of, um, you know, we have examples all over the city, and so does everyone else. Every other community has examples of failure uh, or disinterest. Um, or laziness or whatever you want to call it. But I think overall, um, I'm very pleased with a lot of things that have gone on since I've been here. Uh, I remember standing downtown Flagstaff in 1978 in October. And I, what I remember of downtown Flagstaff, I remember standing at the corner uh, where Weatherford Hotel is and looking out at downtown thinking, why did I move here? Good because it was very ugly and I think downtown is gorgeous with the landscaping and the signage and being having been a part of that over the years. Um, I, I'm very proud to live here. Yeah, thank you for that comment. It's always important to look back on all the progress, right? The example of the billboards is a great one. I've heard from a lot of folks who told me that story and getting the billboards down off Route 66. I think the city did purchase, somebody purchased maybe those rights from 3M, I'm not sure. But but yeah, it was a community effort, right? And it's it, really it beautiful the corridor, yeah. 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 So I think we've made it through all the different topics now through these last four meetings. I'm going to once again, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I do feel like we're starting to have a little bit of meeting fatigue. Some of us that have been at all these and I heard some of that with some of the comments tonight. I think that's natural. I was starting to feel a little fatigue myself, but I feel like we've made it through the, the topics. You know, Mark has drafted language. I do feel like we're at a point where we can next time deliver probably some concise kind of here's what we're thinking uh, on these different topics and put it all together. And um, I think we need to try to get it out sooner than I've been getting it out. Um, typically I've been emailing like on, I guess I just emailed yesterday for today's meeting. So we need to give you some time to review it, I think. Um, so that when we come to the next meeting, we can have a good meaningful conversation about the language, right? And I think the way that I would ask everyone to review it is think about the things that concern you, right? things you want to see accomplished with this PCO, is it being addressed in these draft standards? You know, what have, what are we not addressing? What's left out? Um, think about a situation you think hasn't been taken care of, right? Will it be covered by, by these standards? Is that a fair uh, target mark for I think, yeah. our next meeting and roll up our it's, sleeves? It's not easy, but yeah, people are comfortable with consolidation and eliminating repeated similar language that could be applicable to most situations. That's kind of my mindset. That is what I believe. Yeah. Uh, you know, one, one thing I would say is, you know, uh, for a lot of these things, it's how you frame the conversation when you deliver it to the general public, you know, and a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is already an existing code. And it's not as if that we're reinventing the wheel here. It's already there. Uh, so I think when we're phrasing this to the community, we need to make sure that they understand that we're not reinventing the wheel and creating another set of government regulation bureaucracy that uh, everybody's going to have to jump through roots for. 
it's really consolidating some of the zoning building codes that we have now and bringing it into one ordinance that can be utilized as a tool. So rather than having all of these things scattered throughout our water building codes, there's one place where most of these already existing code requirements are just brought together so that they're they're more visual, they're more yeah. adaptive. I yeah. agree with that. Yeah, that's that's our yeah. big challenge too. Is um, I've shared some of the stuff in the city code that exists. Is yeah, do we create this PCO and get rid of other sections? Do we try to so there's not duplication? That's something like internally we need to figure that out first, and then get the feedback from everyone else. Because there's um, some legalities with where things are in the code. So just for clarification, if I know I'm not going to be at the next meeting, I'm not going to go home this evening and tell my wife that we're not going to go on our vacation because <laughs> I'm going to be here at this meeting. Uh, but I don't give up your vacation. Yeah, but I, I definitely want to participate. So if I look over this information, which I will, mm -hmm. um, and can I email you some comments Absolutely. that you can include in the discussion at the next meeting? Absolutely. And it can be under my name. Yep. David says. Yeah. No, we'll continue to do some work on the website. I appreciate the earlier comments about getting materials out there. We're building this web page and we do have everything we've distributed is up there. But um, I could probably give some more information about receiving information okay. there as well. I do have my contact information up there, but right. make it clear that we want input through this portal. Yeah. Email me I think there. it's great. Yeah. And we're going to talk about compliance, but we're also the idea is out there talking about a program and sufficient funding for Good. code compliance to make it easier to solve situations. So I think that's part. Give that some thought. Any other closing comments? We are a little after seven. Is there anyone online, Sarah, that had a closing comment? No one's been hand up. Does anybody want to raise their hand and, and say a last word before we go? If not, all right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Sorry, Steve had his hand up. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, uh, I, I just want to thank everyone's time and commitment to this process. And the dialogue that we've been having is, is fantastic because we're hearing as many different community members as possible. And I encourage others to get involved and read through what we have on the website. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the thoughtful time and energy that's going into this. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, everyone. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, I'd like to talk with both of you. Yeah. Maybe a second. Sure. Thank you. Well, it's so busy. I'm sitting Mike is on a car today. You did. Yes. That's the nice for show property somewhere else. It recorded the whole time. Hey, Abel, you really.